Hartley and I'm the Senior Communications and Regulation Officer here at the Training Accreditation Council and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on Renewal of Registrations, which forms part of the Training Accreditation Council's Education Program. We would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on, the Wadjuk people. We wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. When you registered, you were given the opportunity to ask a question about renewals of registration. And these questions have been collated and today's webinar is unique because we are privileged to have a panel of experts who will address these questions for us. Our panel members for today are Lisa Barron, the Acting Director of Training Regulation, Karen Booth, the Acting Manager of Regulation, and Russell Docking, who is a TAC appointed auditor. Lisa, your question is, why do RTOs need to apply for a renewal of registration? And does having an audit add value? Um, yeah, great. Thanks, Mel, for the question. And hello, everyone. Um, just before I answer that question, I really want to say that it's really good to be here today. And I'd really like to acknowledge that this is the first time that we've conducted a webinar like this, where we've got a panel made up of the Tax Secretariat staff, as well as Russell as one of our um, auditors. We've also got the pre-submitted questions from our audience and the opportunities to speak to you about the renewal of registration process. I just wanna thank everyone for attending um, initially and for your participation and willingness to be involved in this way. It's really an exciting new delivery mode for TAC and we hope that you find it useful and really informative. As Mel said, at the end of the workshop, we'll be really interested in hearing your feedback on the webinar and the approach used. And as you know, we use this feedback to help inform any future workshops and education program strategies. So the information that you give us is really important. But for now, I'll just move on to Mel's first question about why RTOs need to apply for a renewal of registration. The first thing to know is that the details related to the Council's requirements for the registration of an RTO are specified really in our legislation and regulation. So these are the, count, the things that the Council and all RTOs must do. More specifically, these are detailed in the WA Vocational Education and Training General Regulations 2009, or the VET regs as um, often we call them. While initial registration for an RTO is for two years, the regulations specify that an RTO can only be registered for a maximum period of seven years. And after this time, the RTO will need to renew its registration. About six months before the end of your registration period, your RTO will need to submit an application for its renewal. And when the application is received by the Secretariat, the Secretariat does a risk assessment process. And that really is to work out whether or not an order is required. And I think um, Karen is going to talk through that process a bit later in the, after, after me. So in answer to your second part of the question, Mel, which is about does having an order add value? I think if an audit's required as part of the renewal of registration, it's really important for RTOs to know that the audit can provide an enormous value to them over the period. The audit's really a planned, systemic and documented process to assess an RTO's compliance. And it should give the RTO valuable information about the quality of their training, their assessment, their client services, and the management systems used to meet their obligations and achieve quality outcomes. And really at a minimum, it confirms that the RTO is meeting the standards. Every two years, the council conducts an RTO and stakeholder perception survey with all its RTOs to understand their views and perceptions of the work of the council. And we know this as the RTO survey. The most recent one was conducted in 2022 and the results will be published in the coming weeks on our website if you're interested in having a look at that. But we know from the results of that survey that for RTOs that were subject to an audit, over 85% say that audits are a worthwhile experience and that they add value to their organisation. 
and some of the comments made by RTOs in the survey say that audits really help to identify ways to improve their strategies, that they're very consultative and provide helpful feedback, and that they're a really good learning experience that helps provide clarification on what's expected um, and provides the ability for the RTO to gauge their level of compliance. They also talk about the audit providing an opportunity to improve the, their documentation and their evidence gathering, as well as providing confirmation that the organisation and its systems are doing really well. So I think that kind of shows that there's a really important value for the RTO in the audit experience, that it's not just about a tick and flick process, but it's about a conversation between the auditor the, uh, and the RTO about the critical work that they do. Um, and that's about the work with their students and their employers, their engagement with their industries, how they plan and document and undertake their training and assessment, and the staff that they employ to undertake their work. As many of you know, TAC has an external panel of auditors to undertake audit services on its behalf. In the audit, the auditors will need to see tangible evidence that demonstrates how your RTO meets compliance with the standards that are being audited. Um, and it focuses on a range of business practices within the audit scope and might involve a range of strategies that many of you will be familiar with. Things like site visits, looking through your documentation, Often auditors will ask questions about with your staff about how they implement their training and assessment. They might undertake interviews with students, other stakeholders like employers or third parties. Um, and then they'll track the student's journey for, and records from their pre-enrolment to post-completion and certification. TAC uses the information from these audits to help inform its biennial regulatory strategy and the development of the council strategy is crucial in identifying areas of focus and risk to quality of training. And this all forms part of ensuring high quality vet outcomes in WA. So Lisa, um, just a follow up question to that. Will the areas identified in the TAC regulatory strategy be included in the renewal of registration audit? Yeah, thanks, Mel. That's actually a really good question, and it's one that we get asked fairly regularly. Um, so, as you know, and as I just said, the, um, every two years the Council endorses a TAC regulatory strategy, and our current strategy is from 2021 through to 23, and is due to finish in June this year. And essentially, the strategy identifies specific products and clauses from the standards that the Council wishes to focus on during that period. It's a really important public message to our TAC regulated RTOs and ensures that the work of the Council is transparent to everyone that we regulate. Um, the training products and clauses in our strategy are identified based on research that we do, feedback from our industry and stakeholder consultations, analysing enrolments in various training products, as well as looking at audit compliance data over the previous two years. And that helps us see where non-compliances are higher or might show whether, us where there's signs to risk to quality of training. In our current strategy, we've identified a number of training products and standards that we've been examining over the past two years. The training products include units of competency. And so they're things like uh, units leading to high risk work licenses, first aid, preparing to work safely in the in construction industry or the white card as we know it, or units leading to heavy vehicle licenses, just to name a few. And also there's a couple of qualifications in there as well, like the certificate three in individual support or the cert four in training and assessment. The council also really focuses on some key clauses from the standards. And I imagine there's probably no surprises here and they're ones that the council really would like to keep a bit of a focus on. So clauses 1.1 and 1.2, which is about meeting the requirements of the training product um, and amount of training. Clause 1.8, which is about assessment, meeting the principles of assessment and rules of evidence. And clauses related to training and assessor, vocational competency and industry currency and the qualifications as well. And they're detailed in clauses 1.13 and 1.16. 
So they're all really critical to the quality of training outcomes and student experiences of training and assessment and student res readiness for the workplace. So if you've experienced an audit over the last 18 months or you're due to submit an application in the coming months, it's probably highly likely that if you're delivering any of those training products that appear on the strategy, they'll be included in your audit. And the same will be true for the clauses that I've just talked about then. Um, of course, our current strategy is due to complete at the end of this financial year. And the next strategy, which will be from 2023 to 2025, that'll be developed over the coming months and our industry and stakeholder consultations have commenced. At this stage, it's too early to know what might be included in the strategy. So I don't really have any scoops to give you at the moment in terms of those. Um, but really just keep in mind that if you're planning for a renewal in later in 2023 or into 24, I'd recommend you keep informed and stay up to date on the next strategy once it's released. And that'll be around August 2023, as it's likely your audit will include any of those clauses and training products that you might have on scope. So Mel, that's it from me. Um, and thanks for inviting me to be part of the panel. And I really look forward to hearing everybody's feedback on the session today, given that it's so new for us. Thanks very much, Lisa. So Karen, on to you. Hi. <laughs> uh, from being beginning to the end of the renewal of registration applicant pro application process, how does it go? Okay, well, most people would think it's submit the application, but it actually starts a long time before then. Um, you can actually start getting ready for your renewal of registration application uh, whenever you like. And it's something that you could do as continuous improvement from now until whenever your application is due. Um, we have developed a self-assessment tool, which is located on our website. And I would suggest downloading that and having a look at it. Uh, it will go through uh, what evidence you require, what documentation you'll um, need to submit, and the self-assessment tool itself actually needs to be submitted with your application. Uh, so once you've gone through that process, then it's time to actually submit your application. Uh, this is done via the RTO portal. Uh, we do have some videos on the website which uh, advises you how that's done, takes you through step by step. In addition to that, your regulation officer can also provide you some assistance if you're having any issues. Once you've uh, submitted your application, you'll need to pay a fee. Uh, there is a $900 application lodgement fee and also an assessment fee. And this is based on the size um, of your, the scope and delivery that's in your application. Once we've received your application, your regulation officer uh, will ensure that all the documentation uh, has been submitted with your application. And they'll also contact you if they think that we need some additional information. They will conduct a risk assessment uh, and from this, they will determine whether an audit is required. If it is, they will appoint an auditor and then you receive a written notification advising who your auditor is, uh, the scope of your audit, how the audit will be uh, conducted, and the standards that we'll be looking at uh, when the auditor comes out. Uh, from this point, the auditor will contact you and they will arrange uh, the, the day and time of the audit. Uh, after the audit, the auditor has 10 days uh, to write up the findings in an audit report and submit that to the Secretariat. Uh, from here, if you didn't demonstrate compliance at that audit, uh, that would go to the Director of Training Regulation, who would consider the outcome and might provide, uh, sorry, may provide 20 working days to provide further information and to show that action has been taken to rectify those non-compliances that were identified. Uh, at this point, or if you were compliant uh, after main order and you've demonstrated compliance after the rectification period, um, this information will go to the, uh, the council and they will 
review the information that has been provided and the auditor's findings, and then they will make a determination on what has been provided. Sorry. <laughs> and from here, uh, if they approve your registration, they will provide you with uh, registration for further seven years uh, because it's a renewal. Thanks so much for that, Karen. Um, just a specific um, question about the process. How is the scope of the audit actually determined? Uh, that's all done through the risk assessment. So when we look at the risk, uh, risk, we look at two types of risk. So this is all identified in tax risk, risk framework. So there's provider risk, and this is risk that is identified as part of your RTO. So it's patterns of poor performance. Um, it could be data that's collected from a number of sources. It could be the audit history. Uh, it could also be information that we've received from um, a, another entity or stakeholder, say the State Training Authority, for example. It could also be systemic risk, and this is sector level risk. So it, it may be across many RTOs. And this is the kind of risk that we do identify in tax regulatory strategy. Uh, however, there can be additional things that come to the attention of the council from time to time, and we will also look at this during that time as well. So this is data is also collected from a number of sources. Again, it could be outcomes of complaints. Uh, it could be industry engagement activities and collaboration with stakeholders. But all of this together, uh, is looked at and then it's determined exactly what we'll go in and have a look at. Thanks, Karen. So a question that we got was, uh, can I cancel my audit or change the scope once an audit is scheduled? Once it's scheduled, it is a little bit difficult to do that. Um, obviously, in case of an emergency or something comes up like that, uh, please contact your auditor and TAC as soon as possible uh, to see if arrangements can be made. Uh, another one, if you're wanting to remove items from your scope, it, it's something that you really need to contact us and it, it would be determined on a case by case basis. But once the audit has been um, scheduled, that's what we're expecting to happen. Perfect. So, Russell, now to you. So we've got quite a few questions about what can we expect at the audit? Well, I think it's important to see the audit as an evidence gathering process. So the key idea here is that um, the auditor's role is to gather evidence of compliance with the standards, uh, standards with which you're familiar because they've been around for a long time and you've been working to them for a long time. And so the people who need to be present at the audit are those, those who can provide information relevant to the standards. Uh, and uh, the kind of information that needs to be gathered is evidence that relates to those standards. Uh, in a sense, the rules of evidence apply to this process. So we need evidence that's relevant to the standards. We need evidence of that you're actually what what you're actually doing now, which is currency. We need to know it's the real stuff, which is authenticity, and we need to have enough evidence to be confident that what we're seeing is uh, re reflects what the RTO is doing. But it's important to remember that the auditor is not making a judgment. The auditor is simply the eyes and ears of the uh, Trading Accreditation Council. Uh, it is the council that makes decisions. The auditor simply provides evidence that enables those decisions to be made. Uh, so the standards themselves are the basis for it. Uh, and uh, we then need to think about, well, who's going to be involved in the process? Um, and we start the process with an entry interview. Uh, part of the purpose of the entry interview is to uh, get to know each other in relation to who's who uh, and uh, for the auditor to, to understand the nature and character of the way in which the RTO works. Uh, and part of that will have been learnt by the auditor ahead of time through examination of documentation that you've already provided. But there's nothing quite like face-to-face -face discussion about the way the RTO works and what its uh, objectives are and uh, its operational uh, procedures. So at that entry interview, it's important for the RTO manager or the CEO or both to be there uh, because they, uh, they represent the, uh, the senior leadership of the RTO. 
the compl compliance or quality manager, a person in that kind of role needs to be there um, because they need to be able to raise questions about the process, but also to be mindful of the process that we're going to be following through. Uh, if uh, you're a small RTO, you might have relevant trainers and assessors present. It's not mandatory at the entry interview. Uh, but uh, if you're a large organisation, it might be that, that we'd leave trainers and assessors till later on in the process. And at the entry interview, you might also have consultants present. But it really is important that it is the RTO, not the consultants, that are being audited. And so under those circumstances, the consultants are there perhaps to advise the RTO, but not to respond to auditor questions. Uh, the, the consultants themselves would play a, a, a much much of a backroom role. The standards that are going to be audited, of course, are the standards for RTOs. Uh, but, and when it comes to renewal of registration, unlike extension to scope, pretty well all the standards are reviewed. So I'm just using my checklist here and you can see from this checklist that in terms of standard one, virtually every part of the standard is, is addressed in the audit. There are some sh some here that I'm showing in green, and they would be where applicable. So things like if you're using supervisory arrangements for uh, people in a training role, then those standards would apply. If you're delivering in training and assessment, uh, those standards would apply. Um, when we move to standards two, three, four, and five, uh, pretty well everything is covered. Uh, but again, only some are left uh, as electives, such as if you are using third parties, uh, then parts of standard two would then kick in. Uh, when we go to standards uh, six, seven and eight, uh, we can again see that almost everything is covered. So it's very much like uh, a, an initial registration within the context of, uh, of what or the, the scope, if you like, of the components that are being audited. However, the focus shifts from an initial registration. In an initial registration, you're making a set of promises through, through which you, uh, which you uh, document in the form of, uh, of policies and procedures and resources. In the case of a renewal of registration, we also now have information about what you, you, you also have information about what has happened in the past. So you have evidence of outcomes as well as evidence of ambitions and plans. Uh, and so the audit becomes uh, a, a little less uh, broad in scope, but more significantly focuses now on how the organisation is running, as well as what its ambitions are for the future. So the people who need to be involved in the audit will depend to some extent on the evidence you're gathering. If you look at standards two, three, four, five, six, seven and eight, they're not entirely, but they are more administrative in form. So the kinds of people that you'd be talking to there are going to be people who manage the organisation rather than the trainers and assessors. Whereas if we look at standard one and parts of standard five, you'd, you'd be talking more then to the trainers and assessors, the people who deliver the training and manage the assessment process. Through the process, always, though, we would expect the compliance and quality manager, if you have a person in that role, to be there, partly because uh, they need to observe what's going on and, uh, and understand and um, participate in the process. Also because uh, they would want to write notes as they go to that, that they could refer to later on if there were issues. And those issues might be opportunities for improvement where there are adjustments that, that might be dis discussed or there might be non-compliances, but, but just as much as important is where things are going well, um, the compliance and quality manager might want to make notes about that as well. Uh, but key to standard one will be the trainers and assessors themselves, uh, because they are the people who are interpreting the standards, developing the delivery materials and the assessment tools, and then implementing those materials and uh, assessment tools. So they're a very, very important part of, uh, of the standards and of the audit process at that stage. It may also be necessary and appropriate to interview students. Uh, certainly at some point we would want to look at student files uh, to look at the level of engagement of the students across uh, the range of activities of the RTO. And it may be that we'd want to talk to employers. And in that category, there are employers of graduates who 
can reflect on the way, way in which the RTO is servicing the needs of industry. But there's also employers of students in, say, traineeships or apprenticeships, uh, or where there's work placement involved. The information that we need to see is, going back to the notion of evidence, is, is either documentary evidence, um, uh, where we'd be looking at documents relevant to each clause, and part of the uh, process that was mentioned earlier on uh, uh, was that, uh, by Lisa, was that you could um, do a pre, or might have been current, that you might do a, a, a self audit uh, review. Uh, and in that process, you might identify documentation that you could then use as evidence. But um, there, there could be discussion involved because it may be not so much documented, but of practice, or there could be demonstration. It might involve a walk around the campus, looking at equipment and, and looking at resources and facilities. Um, uh, but the focus will be now much more on implementation and outcomes, uh, clearly also about the future ambitions and, and plans for the organisation. Uh, but the focus will very much be on on how the organisation is working. Ultimately, the auditor will have gone through the checklist, not item by item, but rather uh, as time goes on through the pre-audit uh, examination of documentation, through the discussion and through the documents presented at audit, uh, through the walk around and so on, there will be a point at which the auditor will say, I've got the information I need in relation to each area of scope that has been assigned by the Training Accreditation Council. Um, there may be some final adjustments that need to be made in terms of, well, I need some more evidence about this or I need some more evidence about that. But ultimately, we reach an exit interview, and at the exit interview, you, you will be provided with an oral report. It won't be a written report, but then again, if your compliance officer has been making notes, uh, then uh, you will have your own notes in relation to that. But at the exit interview, we report on good practices, uh, because it really is important to, to recognise that we see wonderful things happening, happening in RTOs. Uh, and that is to be encouraged. And that does have a bearing on things like risk as well. Opportunities for improvement, um, so that where uh, we're seeing something that is compliant, but where the auditor might have an opinion uh, about, uh, about ways it can be improved, the auditor is allowed to give you advice and you're allowed to follow it or ignore it, depending on how you feel. Uh, but there could also be non-compliances, and where the auditor identifies non-compliances, uh, these should have been talked about beforehand, uh, but the auditor at the exit interview will be saying, these are the things that I'm going to report to the Training Accreditation Council, uh, things that need to be remedied. Uh, and at that point, the auditor will mention two things. One is, that remind you that there is an appeals and complaints process that TAC provides for all audits. So if you're not happy with the audit, you can complain. If you're not happy with the observations the auditor is making, you can appeal. Uh, and the next steps uh, would be, as has been mentioned before, if there were no uh, non-compliances, then the 20, uh, uh, the, uh, the simply goes up to council through your case manager. Uh, but if there are non-compliances, then TAC makes a decision about what action to take, including the possibility of evidence review. Uh, and ultimately, um, you would be asked to sign off, not that you agree with the audit, but that the audit happened and that you've been advised on those matters. Thank you very much, Russell, for going through that very comprehensive of what happened, what to expect mm -hmm. at audit. You mentioned um, evidence documentation quite a lot. Does it matter how that evidence is provided and can it be provided electronically? It, thanks, Mel. It, it certainly can be provided electronically. I'm going to confess to a preference here, uh, and that is that electronic information has that kind of ephemeral quality. It's there and then it's gone. Um, and it's very difficult to write notes on digital information. Um, so, uh, electronically, by all means, uh, is perfectly legitimate, um, uh, but there are times when something is more useful in a documented form. For example, the training and assessment strategy document uh, can be very useful in documented form because you're often going to compare the, the documented training and assessment strategy to actual assessment strategies that are used. Uh, and that does mean that when you're making a comparison, it's useful to write notes, 
which means to annotate the uh, uh, the training and assessment document is useful. So I'm not going to prescribe that there has to be something printed. What I am saying is always ask yourself the question, what is going to make it easy for the auditor to get a good grip of the evidence that we're providing? Uh, and uh, and so some of it will be in doc in printed form. Some of it can be in electronic form. And indeed, sometimes the auditor might say, "Look, I'd like you, you to print that out if you would mind, uh, because it's something that the auditor may want to use at, to cross-reference some other evidence that you're providing." Uh, for example, if we're dealing with two bo bodies of evidence, both of which are digital uh, or electronic then it becomes difficult to carry from one to the other, and that's where printed documentation is better. So um, uh, always ask yourself the question as you go, how am I going to represent this evidence to the auditor, which is going to make it easy for them to manage? Too much paper is not a good thing, not enough paper is, n is not a good thing, and you really need to think about how that's going to be managed by the auditor. The auditor will have already examined evidence provided digitally or electronically to TAC. Uh, they will, that will have been passed on to the auditor. The auditor will have already read that and will have, to a large extent, pre-filled the checklist that is used. Um, uh, but that may create questions. The auditor might say, oh, against a particular item, I need more information about this. So there is clearly an electronic or digital body of documentation that is worked from at the beginning. Uh, but uh, later on, um, the auditor uh, will be able to ask questions of you as you go. But try to make the auditor's job as easy as possible. Um, help the auditor to become familiar with the way the organisation works. Um, and, uh, they're, they're the, uh, and the objectives of the RTO. Every RTO has its own kind of flavour, if you like, or colour. And, and that does mean that the auditor needs to understand how you work so that they can understand the evidence you're providing and can, rel can relate that evidence to the standards and provide a fair and uh, accurate representation of the evidence to the council for its judgment. Um, so uh, think ahead of time, make sure that for every clause that's been assigned, you have some form of evidence, either evidence that's digital, evidence that's in paper form, evidence you can provide through discussion, or evidence that you can provide through demonstration. Uh, but some way or other, you need to be able to show the auditor how you are complying with the clause. Um, uh, then uh, use your audit, audit evidence summary, which you've done before, to record that information and then that becomes a useful tool. If you are using, providing the auditor with documents, don't use your RTO in-house in codes, uh, but give it a, a, a logical name which the auditor is likely to understand. And um, make sure that the auditors have ready access to documentation so that they are, uh, um, uh, there's not a lot of time spent searching for stuff. Try to predict what the auditor will need and have it ready so that the audit process goes smoothly for you as an RTO and for the auditor, and then things should go well. Thank you for that, Russell. Um, so I have a bit of a question for you, Karen. So when you are providing the evidence, say a training and assessment strategy, and all of the different um, cohorts, delivery methods are not in that one document, there across a number of documents. Can you just provide one or do you have to provide all of them? Uh, for the application process, we would request that you provide us a sample. Um, so if you've got six or seven, we don't require all of them, but a few that we can have a look at, that we can provide to the auditor for them to have a look at and make uh, do some of that pre-assessment with. Um, at audit, however, you would need to be able to uh, provide all of those training assessment strategies to the auditor uh, for them to review if required. Thanks very much for that. And Russell, how do I provide evidence for something that hasn't happened? Okay, there's an interesting issue there because you can be non-compliant because you've done something wrong or you can be non-compliant because you haven't done something that, that uh, for a lack of evidence. Uh, and so we have to ask the question, is this lack of evidence uh, there because it's not applicable to the RTO? In other words, it's some sort of function that the RTO is not involved with. So for example, um, supervision arrangements, uh, if they're 
if you don't have any staff that need supervision arrangements, we don't expect to see supervision arrangements, and we would simply record those as, those as non-applicable. Um, or there could be, th when it comes to third party arrangements, if you have no third party arrangements, and by this I mean third parties within the frame of uh, standard 2.3 and 2.4, where a, a third party is acting on your behalf as if they, as if they were an RTO, uh, then we would simply record those as not applicable. Uh, and sometimes uh, that can be because you thought an assessment arrangement through a, say, apprenticeship or a traineeship was a third party arrangement, where in actual fact they're simply providing evidence for your assessors to work with, and it's not technically a third party arrangement in that sense. So you might have said yes, uh, and, the, and the TAC may have tagged those as, as criteria to review, uh, but then the auditor discovers they're not really third party arrangements, in which case they'd adjust their report and say not applicable. But where it is applicable, but it hasn't occurred, such as an appeal or a complaint, I mean, we very rarely find appeals and complaints uh, actually being uh, activated because the formal processes, at least, because many RTOs have found ways of resolving that before it becomes part of the formal process. Uh, then we would simply look at the policies and procedures, much as we might uh, for an initial registration where nothing has happened. What we'd be asking the question is, are you ready to cope with and respond to appeals and complaints? Um, obviously, we'd be very happy to see that there were no appeals and complaints, but we'd also be happy to see that you are ready to deal with them should the need arise. Yeah. Thanks, Russell. Um, before you were talking about student records, and I've just got a couple of questions about that. Um, when you look at the student records, do you pick who you look at? Um, does the RTO? Uh, what sort of um, do you want to see in there in the records? Um, that kind of thing. What exactly happens? Well, okay, there are a number of different kinds of student records that we'd look at. Um, so if we're looking at training and assessment, um, we might say, well, uh, and in particular, say assessment records, we, we may want to look at students who have succeeded and students who have not, uh, because we want to see how not only how judgments are made in relation to the assessment process, but how the RTO and the student have responded to those judgments. Uh, and so, for example, recently I was looking at an example where students got things wrong. Uh, you could see then that supplementary training had been provided and that the assessments were then adjusted to accommodate the fact that the student had subsequently demonstrated competence. So what we see there is a kind of narrative which says not only um, is the RTO being uh, closely, closely examining student performance, but they're responding to student needs uh, uh, by providing additional training and then following up with further assessment. And that narrative tells us that that RTO is working well, and that's really good to see. So we don't want to just see the successes, we want to see the challenges as well, because that tells us a lot about how the RTO is going. When it comes to things like looking at uh, student records, if you like, from cradle to grave, from initial interest to certification, what we want to see there is a kind of narrative of the student's life with the RTO, which could be just one day, or it could be a year. Um, but what we want to see is uh, sort of the way in which the students move through from that initial interest uh, through enrolment, uh, through participation, uh, through assessment, and then through to certification. And in that way, we get a whole of life picture, if you like, of the way in which the RTO uh, supports and manages the training and learning experience and assessment experiences of the learner uh, through to ultimately through to certification. And that gives tells a lot about how the RTO works. So um, when it, Mel, you also asked about whether we select the students or you do. Um, initially, we would expect you to select students, but then again, you might have selected some juicy choice uh, examples. Uh, and it's not uncommon for an auditor to say, now I want to see this kind of student. I might want to see uh, uh, someone who's gone through RPL. I might want to see someone who's in, where credit uh, has been involved. Uh, so the auditor will may well ask to see things that have not been uh, predicted before. And indeed, uh, you'll find in the letter that advises you of the audit, the, the, the auditor may 
select to audit other criteria or seek other evidence, and that's part of the audit process. What we're about is getting the evidence uh, that enables us to say with confidence uh, uh, which picks up that notion of sufficiency, that what we're doing is fairly representing you as an RTO uh, to and your work to the council. Uh, and, and if there are issues that need to be resolved, it's good to find them out because you then have an opportunity to deal with them. Uh, it's best to find those issues rather than to leave them hidden away. Awesome, Russell. And just also on the student theme, when you do interviews with students, do you do them there? Do you call them up? Do you call the same students that you looked at the records? So what's the process there? Well, again, it's going to be very de dependent on what sort of evidence we need. Um, and we're most likely to follow up with students because we're beginning to be concerned about particular issues. And again, we need to understand are we fairly representing this RTO's situation? Uh, so we may well follow up students whose files we've looked at. Uh, that if they, if it's during class time, it's possible that we could see students then. Uh, if it's not, then we may well follow them up by phone calls. Um, uh, so this would always be done through the RTO. We would always make sure that the RTO was aware of the fact that we're doing that. and would obviously get information from it. And you will find that most RTOs, when they talk about enrolment or when they are providing information in a student handbook, uh, make it clear to students, most RTOs will make it clear to students that the, the, their documentation and information will be treated in confidence, uh, but that it will be accessible to organisations, regulatory authorities and the like. Uh, so it's not inconsistent with uh, the, the information that the students would have been provided with. Um, but um, it will depend a great deal. I mean, it's not always the case that you will interview students, uh, but it is um, uh, in some circumstances, like in strategic audits, it's often a requirement of the audit. In other cases, it's where necessary or where it's, where it's going to provide useful information. Thank you. Yeah. And Karen, from the beginning to approval, how long does it roughly take for the whole process? It is dependent on the outcome of the audit. Um, we would say anywhere usually from three to six months, um, three being everything is compliant, main audit, um, everything was provided with the application uh, to six months where possible non-compliances uh, non have been identified. Um, so yeah, allow that period um, and if it does look like um, your expiry date will occur before your renewal has been approved, uh, that will be provided to the council to consider providing an extension. Oh, perfect. So we'll never let your <laughs> registration run out while you're through the process. Yes. Great, thank you. And Russell, as an auditor and, and in all your years of experience, <laughs> uh, what are your top tips on being prepared for a registration renewal? Okay, I think one of the things I could say is keep cool. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the first thing is to be prepared. Um, that is, make sure that there are no evidence gaps, that if fundamentally you're not uh, going to find yourself in a situation where the auditor asks to see some evidence and that you can't locate it. Um, that's to remind you again, though, that the evidence is not always documented. It may be evidence that you need to provide through discussion or through demonstration. The second thing I'd say is please relax. This is not a sudden death event. It's not even a slow death event. It's not a death event of any kind. Um, uh, it, it is a process which is designed to provide strength to the work you do as an RTO uh, and to provide uh, reassurance and, uh, and, cr and recognition within industry and the community. Um, uh, so it, we are we take a kind of collegial view rather than a uh, we don't think of it as a police raid. So be, if you have a, a, a team of trainers and assessors who are nervous about this process, please reassure them that it's a, a very humane, uh, gentle, and collegial process. Uh, it, it's not meant to be an aggressive process. It is meant to be a process that. Uh, is calm. Um, uh, that's not to say that people don't feel nervous. Uh, th that is a quite common response. 
uh, and it really is a very important that, that, that people, people find a way to relax. So think about any problem that is found as an opportunity to improve. Don't think of it as a kind of criticism or an attack uh, or anything of that, of that kind, but rather as something discovered that can lead to improvement and has already been mentioned right at the beginning um, that the response from most RTOs is that audits of this kind are, are welcome because they provide you with an opportunity to reflect on what you do and improve on what you do. But I would say that non-compliances are identified from time to time and where a non-compliance is identified, please feel comfortable about I'm going to use the word arguing. Uh, I don't want to use the word defend because that sounds like it's an attack. Uh, but be prepared to discuss the problem because it may be that the auditor has not seen all the information. And quite commonly one finds that there is information about it. And you get that sort of aha response where the person says, ah, oh, that's what you're looking for. I've got that over here. And they produce evidence that exactly what you need. So it may be that you didn't quite understand what evidence was needed um, or maybe didn't immediately recognise that this evidence would relate to this criterion. So be prepared to discuss it. Uh, it might be that, um, th that there has been a misunderstanding by the auditor about the client group you're dealing with, the way in which you deal with things, or even in relation to the expectations of industry. So you may need to educate the auditor. I mean, it's not uncommon for an auditor to find that they need to learn from the process. Um, at the end of the day, though, uh, the compliance or non-compliance is determined by the standards. And so if the auditor is still not satisfied that what you're doing pr is providing evidence of compliance with the standards, both through your plans and through your activities, then the auditor will stick with uh, non-compliance. But don't just let it go through unless you've had a decent discussion about it. The auditor is not allowed to advise you about how to resolve it, but you are allowed to postulate or hypothesize uh, about ways you might deal with it. Um, so it's, it's, it can be that kind of collegial discussion, but the auditor cannot tell you how to deal with it or solve it as, a, as an issue. But they can spend time explaining to you why it's uh, non-compliance and not surprisingly such an explanation often gives you some pretty good hints about how you might resolve it and finally be flexible be frank and be fearless don't feel that uh, that this is uh, meant to be a, an aggressive experience it's meant to be a gentle uh, but nonetheless searching experience and if i can sum it up in two words don't panic Thank you so much. Uh, that brings us to the conclusion of this webinar. And I would really like to thank the presenters, Lisa, Karen and Russell, for providing their knowledge and expertise today on renewals of registration. I would also like to thank you for your participation as well. And I hope you have found this webinar informative. If you have any further questions, I would encourage you to speak to your regulation officer. That is why they are there. And a recording of this session will be available on Tax YouTube channel and on our website. I would also like to let you know that our website address will be changing at the end of this month. So keep a lookout for um, notifications, emails, um, and also the tech update. A certificate of attendance and a short survey will be emailed to you in the next week. So once again, thank you so much and goodbye.